I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, you guys can oh, I can hear everyone now too. Okay, thank you. Have I missed anything? My apologies. My connectivity was spotty. No, we, we're okay, still waiting. Right. We're still waiting. Okay. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, Ms. Dawson. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we um, You got my apologies for my lateness. I didn't, but I'm hearing it now, so welcome. <laughs> Please let me know if you can hear me. We can hear yes, you. I can hear you. Yes. I, I, we didn't get an apology, so I'm not sure. Okay, I, I, okay, so then you didn't hear me. I, I said I apologize for my lateness. I was just getting in. I mean, uh, okay, there's a little feedback, a little dragging. I'm not sure, but I, I okay. got the. Let tailor. me try to, let, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna log out and come back in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. Still Hello. Clear. Is it any better? That's cl quite clear. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And I apologize for being late. I was just running a little late coming in. Okay. Nice to have you. Nice to meet you, everyone. Um, just so I can get a name for the register. I hope I didn't lose anyone in coming back in. You want us to give our names? My name is Samantha Carver. No, I'll, I'll just call the oh. names that I see on the screen and you can just confirm. Okay, um, okay, okay. I see Dion Butler. Yes, I'm here. Um, Roseanne Bastian. Yes, I'm here. And if I'm saying it incorrectly, you can correct me, please. Thank you. Samantha Cartwright. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that one. Akua. I don't know that one. Can you say that name? No, I, I didn't. Right. Akua and Yanni. Okay, Miss Anyani. Okay. And Cicely Johnson. Hi, yes. Okay. So it's usually just for since in this class. Can you repeat that? You you went out just now. Is you there only it? five persons in the class? No, CC was just on. Um, okay, but so I don't know what happened. It seemed like it dropped. CC Lafleur. Okay. Okay. Okay then. So I'll wait for how to get back in. Okay. So my name is Denise Dorset, and I think I'm only taking you to. I don't. What module you supposed to do tonight? Just module eight. Yes. yes, yes. 
Okay, so we'll do module eight, and I think module nine we'll do next week. Is there a lag? There's, There's a lag. Time. There is a lag, yes, ma'am. I don't know what's going on. Let me try another. I think you said we're going to do module eight and then it kind of lied. Okay. Let's see if that helps. Okay, um, let me know if it's any better on this one. Okay. Is it any better or are we still having a lag? No, you, we can hear you. That's this better for me. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Okay, um, so last week you would have done module seven. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to view it. it was on employee termination redundancy and dismissal yes we did and you know what garden leave is sorry can you repeat that You are, you know what garden leave is, garden leave. I don't recall that one. Yes, um, garden leave is when an employee gives uh, an executive a long period of notice of dismissal in order to prevent them from working with the, um, the opposition or, from, or the competition. Right, so that probably would be in the case of someone who's like a managing director or someone who's had the inner workings of the company, they wouldn't want them to be out there so soon oh, yes. and be able to yes, yes. give away their trade secrets. Yes. What yes. about wrongful dismissal? Yes. yes. Um, wrongful dismissal. When where does when does wrongful dismissal occur? Is it when somebody's um, not given enough notice, inadequate right. notice? Right, so whereas there's not notice or whether notice was inadequate. And what are they entitled to if we were wrongfully um, dismissed? Is it monetary? monetary? Remuneration. So what, we, what is what is damages um, for what? Would we call in it when you wrongfully dismiss me? I'm at a loss of that one. Okay, so if I am wrongfully dismissed, you have breached my contract. And you have to compensate me by um, paying me damages, which will be compensation for the dismissal. And it is the aim is to put the employee in a position they would have been had the contract been performed as agreed. Yes? Yeah. What about summary dismissal? What, what section of the Employment Act covers that? Section 34. 31. 34. 31. 31. And what what can you be the summary summarily dismissed for? Um on the misconduct, um, gross misconduct or um theft, breach theft, yes, um, breach of uh, um Breach of so confidentiality. Right. And who must prove that there was a there's a breach in this instance? The employer. The employer. 
We have a case that tells us about that. We have a case that gives us guidance. What, what is the case? The case that is noted here is Carnival Leisure Industrial <laughs> versus Peter Zervos. Right, so that's the case that is, is a common law case that guides you on the employer having to prove that the that he believed on the balance of probability that the employee had committed the misconduct. What about redundancy? We have anything? What what section covers redundancy and when does redundancy occur? There was no information provided on redundancy. Didn't say we didn't cover redundancy. Oh, you all didn't go through that? Oh. No, we didn't cover redundancy. Okay, so I guess she skipped on. It's so section 36 then. Okay. And it's when your, your your job ceases to exist, when they decide uh, the company decides that you they, the employee no longer um, to perform the task. Okay. Now, did she say why you all didn't cover redundancy? We talked a lot about, well, last week we did a lot of cases on um, wrongful dismissal and um, summary, dis dismissal, summary dismissal. So we kind of reviewed cases, mm -hmm. um, a few cases last week. Okay. Um, which were pretty much examples of wrongful dismissal and everything. Okay. So on, I guess it would be, she would leave it up to you to read the rest of the chapter then. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I was just trying to recap, but I wouldn't want to recap where you not covered. So we'll move on to module eight. Okay. It was just so you'd get um, a refresher and to continue on with the other chapter, but um, I wouldn't want to open up where you've not um, covered as yet. In module eight, employee relations and trade unions, after we would have completed this unit, we should be able to gain knowledge on the law governing employee relations, develop an awareness of the registration and recognition of trade unions in the Bahamas, gain an understanding of industrial collective bargaining agreements and how they relate to and impact the unionized work environment, develop an awareness of the impact of trade union, membership and activism on the employer-employee relationship and examine the challenges and intricacies of industrial action. Would you have had an opportunity to read the chapter already? Yes. Okay, so then we'll be able to go through this pretty quickly. What I usually do is go through, um, we read the chapter and then I try to break it down um, as we read, okay? So I don't know who wants to begin to start to read the definition of a trade union, legality of trade unions. Um, do you want to read from the beginning, reading word for yeah, word? Yeah, we'll read the whole chapter. We'll just read it in portions with each person contributing. Okay, I can read just the definition. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay. Under the Industrial Relations Act 1970, a trade union is defined as any combination or association of employers or employees, whether temporary or permanent, the principal object of which are the protection and furtherance of lawful interests of its members, who in the case of trade union of, of employees are employees, and in the case of trade union of employers are employers. The Industrial Relations Act outlines the process and governs the practice of the registration and control of trade unions in the Bahamas. In order to be lawful, a trade union must be registered by the Registrar of Trade Unions in the Ministry of Labor under certain prescribed conditions regarding membership, purposes, and other related factors. It is unlawful for a person to participate in any activity of a trade union that is not registered by the Registrar. The freedom of association upon which trade union membership, participation, and activism is predicated is enshrined in Article 24 of the Constitution of the, of the Bahamas, which grants a person the right to exercise his freedom 
of peaceful assembly and association with other persons and to form and belong to political parties and trade unions or other associations for the protection of his interests. Okay, so we'll stop there. Okay. So the Industrial Relations Act 1970 defines what a trade union is. And we have a definition where it's a combination or association of employers or employees, whether they are te temporary or permanent. And they are to protect and further the lawful interest of its members. Where there are employees or whether there are employers, the trade union will represent. The Industrial Relations Act now would govern uh, um, the, it's the, it, guides you with the process and the governance of how they register and control trade unions in the Bahamas. And in order for any trade union to be lawful, it must be registered by the Registrar of Trade Unions in the Ministry of Labor. This is usually um, the Director of Labor who usually assumes this title in this instance um, as we don't have a registrar outside of um, the director of labor. So he would be the person you would write to and then it would go on to the minister of labor thereafter. Ms. Dorset? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my apologies. I'm, I'm not in the best um, area for connectivity. Do you okay. have, I, I have a curiosity question. Do you have any idea, not exact number, but can you presume how many unions we have here within the country? Any clue? No, I don't have a clue, to be honest. Okay. Okay, I just wondering. Yeah, yeah. I don't know um, the amount because, you know, we had a lot of splits as well. We had um, probably about six before, but now they are split out because we have two teachers unions now and then the customs and the immigration breakout. They went, went away from the public service. So it's a lot of unions now, but I don't have an idea of the amount. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, is there anyone within our class, is anyone work for a company that is that has a union? Anyone on here? Who's dealing with a union? Anybody? No one? No one? Okay. No. 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 Okay. Yeah. But it, it is... Go it's ahead, good Mr. practice with the trade union because you have a lot of persons who now work with you who are now taking on the persona of a person who is in a union. They use, mm -hmm. um, they're utilizing the Employment Act to their advantage and they're getting information from outside. So it's best that um, once you're in an organization, you really are aware and are informed as to what are the rights of your employees because they know them pretty well. Yeah, ironically, I mean, this is so coincidental. We're talking about unions because mm -hmm. last week and this week, I had two separate unions approach us. I'm um, the head of HR for NHI and I had them approach us just about possibly joining them. So I just felt it was interesting that two back to back, right? Yeah, <laughs> so that means yeah. they're fighting for your members, for your employees membership. Right, right, right. Which and that's know, a given great. that I mean NHI. It's a given that you would have union sh surely sh um, entering your um, with your employees shortly. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see because yes. we, we're, we're trying to remain union free. You sound like you're pro union, Mister Brisson. <laughs> so it's just that I'm saying that you're gonna have that, so you would want to be really equipped to deal with them because they come with things now. They may not be well versed enough, but they know enough of the law. They they can sit down and have a conversation with you, but you just need to be able to have that conversation as well and know what your rights are as, and what their rights are. Yeah, for sure, for sure. My colleagues who are unionized, it seems to be you know quite challenging. But yes. I mean, nonetheless, thank you for letting me ask ask the question. I know we're just not on page one, so yes, we can move forward. Thank you, thank you. Right. So now the trade union um, is based on the freedom of association, which is enshrined in our constitution, and that's Article Twenty Four. And they have a right to exercise freedom of assembly and association with others and to form and belong to political parties and trade unions. So that would be your guide. And you know, the constitution is the highest um, order um, form of governance in the Bahamas and it, it trumps any other act that comes into play. So 
the um, constitution would now, would have allowed trade unions and political parties and for you to exercise your right to belong, form and belong to those. So there's no act that can go against um, what the articles, what the constitution says. So they are pretty, that's why the trade union has so much power, I guess, here in our country. Any questions? Okay, let's go on. Okay. However, freedom of association and assembly must be viewed and treated within the context of the restrictions imposed by what is considered reasonably required under the provisions of the constitution. Specifically, those prohibitions in the interest of defense, public order, public policy, public health, public safety, public morality, and for the purpose of, pro of protecting the rights and freedoms of other persons. Additionally, restrictions are imposed upon persons holding office under the crown and members of a disciplined force, for example, police force, defense force, etc. Or in the case where the assembly or association is proven to not be reasonably justifiable in a democratic society. So in as much as we have the rights under the constitution to form a union or to gather peacefully, it must not be contrary to um, the interests of defense, public order, public policy, public health, public safety or public morality or for the purpose of protecting the rights and freedom of other persons. Again, the union, the police are not um, included, the police force or the defense force, because we would be in absolute chaos if they now were to get together and say they're striking, eh? So we're not allowed, they've, they're not allowed to now form a union to now hold the country at bay. Do you think um, the nurses should have had a union or doctors? Personally, no, I don't think they should. Yeah, I mean, because so, that, that affects us as well, eh? Yeah. So it's, so it's interesting, Ms. Dorset, that, um, you know, we're saying like who should and who should not Right. unionize and as you're stating it's those that would be detrimental to the country versus right. those that are not let's support them unionizing you know what I mean right no <laughs> what I'm saying is right if it's based on for public order public policy public health public safety now if it's for public health or safety if you now close down the hospitals because you don't have staff because they unionized and they needed to get paid this week, would that be in good, that is that in good conscience that they should be allowed to now hold the country a hostage? No, would, I completely agree. No, yeah, I completely I'm just agree, saying but... restrictions should have been imposed upon that sector as well. The teachers, I think, uh, I mean, if you look at it, this could be detrimental to all aspects of society at any given point, eh? That was my point. Yeah, that was my point. Perfect. Right. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. With you, yeah. yeah. So it it it. I mean, they have some tweaking to do, but I think they needed to at least look at that. It can't be just for if I'm protecting the society as a police officer or defense force, but protecting the borders. What happens if you have ailments and you have everyone calling out. I mean, that was a disaster just recently with the doctors and the nurses. So I don't know that that um, lends well to the country or for the students now um, when the teachers just fail to um, show up because of either the classroom is not in order or they wanted to get paid this amount or they needed hardship. I think it's really um, a disadvantage and some jobs should be vocations and not jobs where you're looking to be paid. So that's the, that's my position on it. That's not um, the class's position, of course. As well as um, the other day when the pharmaceuticals. Um, yeah, I mean. And they it, wanted to strike as well. And you have, I mean, you close up a pharmacy on a, mm -hmm. in a country where 
there's so much chronic illnesses yeah. that that is totally yeah. that was against everything and i think yeah. that's Unethical. why they pulled them in so quickly because yeah. that would really be against some um, public order policy yeah. it's and safety eh? yes so that won't be i mean they have to draw the line somewhere because i mean it can't just draw down to you don't care about your brother or sister anymore it's all about money right so Agreed. the trade union doesn't lend well to how people now behave on the job because you know they so concerned about their rights they forget they come there to work mm -hmm. so that's what i i don't like about the unions if i'm being honest Okay. Any uh, any questions on what are the restrictions, prohibitions in the interest of defense and all that stuff? Um, Austin, I know um, the police have a staff association. Right. So they kind of like the union in terms of the benefits and, and advocate. Will they advocate for them to be like to get these insurances and the like and for them to to be looked after, but I don't think they have the right to hold the country at bay based on on this restriction or prohibition that's within that um definition. So you know you have the right to be your information to be confidential. Nobody should disclose your information unless it is contrary to public policy they may have to disclose it. You see what I'm saying? The yeah. doctors have your information. They can't disclose it because that, but if it's if it's in the interest of public, of, of the public or for the protection of a country, they will certainly disclose it, eh? So yes. likewise, yeah. when it comes to the police, I think that kicks in. They can, they can advocate for them to get certain things, but it can be that you will be to the detriment of the Bahamas as a whole. For the public safety, okay, understood. Right, okay. Okay, let's continue. Who is, I think um, Ms. Butler is done. We can go to the next person to help us out. Uh, sure, Ms. Dorset, Ms. Dorset, my apologies. I'm actually off island. I had to okay. leave the island suddenly, so okay. I left my stuff. <laughs> But okay. I'm following. I'm following. <laughs> okay, so we'll get somebody else who can. We may need to do a double shift then. Um, <laughs> are we on registration of trade unions? Where, yes, where we are. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I don't mind starting there. Thank you. Re registration of the trade unions in the Bahamas. The registrar is empowered by the Industrial Relations Act to register trade unions. Oh, we lost her. Yes. Yes, looks so. Okay. Ms. Butler, you want to continue until she comes back, please? No problem. Thank you. The, the registrar is empowered by the Industrial Relations Act to register a trade union within the definition prescribed by that act. There must be at least 15 members for a trade union of, of employees and at least three members for a trade union of employers for registration. Okay, so let's just go back. Who's the registrar, we said in this case? The director of the labor. director of of labor. Yeah. And, and in order for us to um have a trade union of employees, how many members we must have? Three. And for the union three, of 15, employers. 15, 15 for 15. employees and three for employers. employers. Okay, so let's make sure we have these numbers down and we remember these things. We remember where we starting off, who, which act covers the trade unions? Industrial Relations Industrial Act, Relations Act. 1970. Uh -huh. And what else? Constitution of the Bahamas. Excellent. And what particular article? 24. Excellent. Okay, let's continue. Additionally, the trade union is required to have a constitution in order to be registered one may be adopted by reference to the model constitution in the Industrial Relations Act. The trade union must not have an unlawful purpose amongst its purposes, otherwise it shall be made void. And every trade union is required to have a registered office. For example, office where all correspondences, 
official documents, etc., may be sent. Okay, so the trade union, in order to establish itself, first of all, for the employees, they must have 15 members. For the mm -hmm. employers, they must have at least three. Then they must have a constitution. If they don't have one, they can adopt the one that's already a model in the Industrial Relations Act. So usually you have a schedule which says you can adopt um, the first schedule of the Industrial Relations Act, and that usually is a constitution. Unless you want to tailor it to suit your purpose, you can use that um, if you don't have one. Again, in your um, constitution, you cannot have it, um, the trade union um, being formed for an unlawful purpose. So you can't say this trade union is formed to sell as, or to represent. Remember in one instance, um, we had the gaming society, the gaming, the gamers, what island like those, what they call them, the number houses. Right. So if they were still illegal, could we have formed a trade union as members of the gaming industry? No. Because that would be for what? An unlawful purpose. Lawful purpose. Right. right. So mm -hmm. they could not form a union. So right now they're trying to advance um marijuana as a um well they keep talking about it. Mysterial so, drug. Right. So we couldn't Except. have a shop, we couldn't represent. Um, persons who are not interested in going into um, farming or selling marijuana, eh? that would be an unlawful purpose, right? Right. So if it is formed for an unlawful purpose, what becomes of it? Shall be made void? Yes. Again, they must have a registered office and that would be where they would have all correspondences sent to official documents because I shouldn't be looking anywhere other than where you have your registered office situate to drop off documents to serve you, to tell you, um, to address you any matters that you may have. I can't be sending it to anybody else. It has to be a registered office. Well, mm -hmm. it's an uh, official office where correspondence can be sent to official documents. Okay, so we, we, we build it. Yes, Ms. Dossett, um, can you clarify when you said that if they do not have um, a constitution, um, that they should refer to one from the, you said the industrial? Right, so they have a standard document that you can adopt. So if you were incorporating Can you a give company, an example? Can, okay. you, yeah, can you give an example of that, please? No, so you actually have to look in your act and it's okay. there. So I'm gonna okay. share it. I'm gonna share it for you whilst you're on here so you'll see. Um, okay. What so if they about. don't have if they do not have a constitution in terms of like why or a governing um something to govern by what so they should they should go to the standard ones. Right. So they will put that. that that we adopt um, the first schedule of the Industrial Relations Act. Okay. So um, I don't know, you did your do companies or no? No. Sorry? You all have done company incorporations where you have to adopt the first schedule of the act or no? No, no. no. Okay, so in companies, they do the same thing. Um, they have a model constitution that you can use in the Industrial Relation Act. Um, let me just get it pull up for you so we can see how it looks. Constitution. Okay. And you are referring to your um, act now. Remember, you all have to use your act to help you in in um, just understanding what is set out in the book as well, okay? Mm -hmm. So you all refer to your acts when you when you are uh, um, reviewing, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so in this instance, you now go into your um, industrial relations. Ah, uh, okay. I'm gonna pull it up to see where the constitution is in this remuneration of the board of functions, okay. Okay. 
And I think it's all the hero pensions is a sign of the termination. Okay. So it's in the fourth schedule. No, that's not the fourth schedule. Disciplinary procedures, collective disputes, grievances. And so they settled the whole thing. And this is all their schedule. So I'm just trying to get it up so you could get to the right pages. Collective bargaining. Uh, it starts at. Mm. Okay. So it's the third schedule, it seems to be. Mahanas to provide. Okay. So it's part three, section nine. So you will go from there. You will, you will, okay, let's try to share the screen now. Let's try to share it. And uh, share the screen. I'll be looking at this one. Share. Can you see this? Yes. yes. Okay. So this would be a constitution you can use. So it starts from 62. And you can go right down. Let me make sure that's where it starts. No, it starts a little earlier. Part one. So we'd start from part one. So you can use all of that. You don't have to. So you start here. You don't have to use, Definitely. you wouldn't okay. have to start, you wouldn't have to create one. You can just adopt this more okay. or less. So okay. you have here the name of the trade union and the place right. for the union, all that stuff. Right, so, okay. And all of this would be in your constitution if you had to do it yourself. Okay. But now you wouldn't have to worry about it. You could just say we adopt this. And then if there's anything in there that's not right. part of you can you want, it out. you can take you it can out. You can take it out, okay. Okay. So, okay. you would just say accept. So, for, so you for, don't have to, you, that's what I'm saying. So you wouldn't have to do it. You um, wouldn't have to recreate word the for word. Okay. Right. If or, you, okay. or you could take out what you don't want. And if right. you don't want to adopt it whole, sale, right. then you right. would tailor it to suit your needs. Okay. So this would be a guide. So then. Guideline. So like right. a guideline. Okay. Right. So anybody okay. could pop up and do their own trade union. They don't have to find nobody to help them out if they can follow this. Um, so they have all the collective bargaining and all that stuff, you see? Okay, okay. So that's where we'll find this in the trade union, I mean, the industrial relations act. So you see where I'm at? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we'll just, you will just adopt it by reference to the model constitution in the industrial relations. Industrial trade, okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, right. thank you. So now we go on to the registrar. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The registrar may cancel the registration of any trade union that is non-compliant with the laws of the Bahamas under Section 15 of the Industrial Relations Act. Section 21 of the Industrial Relations Act gives him the power to hold election of officers for a trade union where it fails to do so. So we had instances where there are power struggles in unions, eh? Where they, where they don't want to be um, ousted more or less for, by way of election, they would just um, delay the process for them to be, you know, they had that, in, they had that in, in one of the unions where they should have already called an election and they failed to do so. Y'all you, you remember that? Yeah. I, think I don't know if it was the teachers or what. Um, but they had the, the, so now in the act, it allows the registrar, if they have failed to do so within a specified period, he now has the power under section 21 of the Industrial Relations Act to hold elections of officers where, it, where the trade union fails to do so. So if we have the president, the vice president, secretary, treasurer, they know um, if they call an election, they're going to be ousted they would now try to delay it. The members could now approach the, the registrar and ask 
for him to now step in and hold the elections of officers in the instance where the trade union is um, failing or refusing to do so. Again, he may also cancel the registration of any trade union that is non-compliant with the laws of the Bahamas under Section 15 of the Industrial Relations Act. Okay? Okay. All right, go ahead. Section 20 requires there to be a secret ballot for the election and removal of officers of a trade union. The amendment of its constitution and for any decision of a strike action particularly by a union of employees. There are penalties under the Industrial Relations Act for persons who fraudulently provide a false copy of a trade union's constitution or who fraudulently misrepresents that a union is registered when it is not. Once registered, trade unions have a quasi-legal persona personality. Properties of the trade union are vested in trustees and may be leased or owned in their name. Trade unions may also sue or be sued in the names of the trustee. There are legal capacity restrictions on who may be a member and officer of a trade union. Under the law, no person under the age of 16 is allowed to be a member of a trade union and no person under the age of 18 is allowed to be a trustee officer or committee member of a trade union. Okay, so the trade union has a quasi-legal personality, which means that they are not a legal person. They are somewhat of a legal person, but not fully a legal person. So if you are a legal person, that's a company, or um, let's see what else could be, we could refer to more or less is companies. So companies have a, a legal person and we are natural persons. So the companies can now act in its own name and on, uh, on its own. We can act in our own name and on our own. The trade unions cannot. They are, um, their properties are vested in trustees and only can be leased or owned in the name of the trustees who are either um, natural persons or a legal person. Do you understand that? No, no. ma'am. No, okay. ma'am. <laughs> okay, so a legal person is usually an in So as a natural person, we can do things. We can open a bank account. We can enter contracts. We can buy property. Um, we can negotiate and do all those things. A company can do the same thing to their officers and directors. They are a legal person. They're recognized as a legal person. So we have natural and legal persons in that instance. In the trade union, they are not a legal or a natural person. They're quasi-legal. They can do certain things, but they're not able to act in their own name because it's not a it's not representative of a legal or a natural person. The mm. trustees who are now elected would now represent the union. So okay. if we were to purchase property in the name of the union, it would be in the name of those trustees. Oh, okay. If, if the trustees die or retire, they should have some provisions to um, for smooth transition into a new trustee or for property to be easily moved into a new trustee's hand because you're only holding it in trust for the members of the union. It is not your own. And so equity will recognize you as not the legal owner, but you you, you are the equitable owner. You are the owner only based on, you're the legal owner in the eyes of the law, but equitable owners are the union, um, the trade union members. So if I am holding a property on behalf of um, my child or my sister for the benefit of a child, what am I, a trustee, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. because the child is not of age and they can't hold property in their name that where this that's where the 16 and 18 comes in eh? mm. so under the age of 16 you can't contract with anyone you understand yeah okay you know that you know that part of it eh? right okay so under the age of 16 you can't um be in the trade union because you can't sign any documents contracting yourself or you need somebody else to sign on your behalf Right. 
under 18, you're not an adult. You cannot be a trustee, officer, committee member of a trade union. Again, you can't contract yourself out. Somebody still has to sign along with you or on your behalf. So in this instance, the, the, the trade union is similar to a minor, but not a minor. It's a legal entity that's guided by trustees who are either natural or legal persons because the, tr the trade union is not able to hold property or to contract in its own name. These persons would have to sign on their behalf. Is that any better? Uh, so yeah. in, case, in cases where, um, let's say you have the teacher's union mm -hmm. and so the elected president, um, no. Ms. Wilson, that's not a no. case, would you make a reference No, she's to? an no. officer. She's, they have trustees. Okay. So the trustees are separate and apart from okay. the president and the But you said something president. about being elected though. You said trust is, uh, so a trustee- Yeah, the trustees the now, they they usually are appointed um, and they would come together based on the membership and also the officers, but they are not so easily removed as an officer or they, they don't serve in the capacity as a officer their time frame may be longer. So you wouldn't have a trustee constantly be changing. More so they are appointed, they are appointed by whom? They are appointed through the membership. So in a trust, I own a property and I'm a settler and I settle the property with a trustee, a, a person who I, I have some faith and confidence that if I pass this over to you, you would now do what you were supposed to do with it for the benefit of the people I actually want to benefit from it. I don't right. want you to use it for your own purpose. Right. So it will be through the members who would now elect and the executives who would now um, appoint trustees okay. based okay. on their relationships. Because um, usually the trustees would be a member of the union. You wouldn't just appoint someone outside. You would have somebody inside. You may have some legal representation as a part of the trustees, um, but usually they try to stay within their membership. And that trustee is now the person who's going to be um, vested with all of your legal property, who will now sign contracts on your behalf and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And they would make decisions um, as well for the union to say, you know, as much as the president wants to make her own decisions, she has to consult with the trustees because the mm -hmm. trustees act in the best interest of all of its members. Because now mm -hmm. they're fiduciary. And we know what fiduciary is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what the, the purpose of the trustees would be. So the trustees are now elected or appointed and, and they represent the union as the um, legal person whose whose name is out there. So if we have John Doe, Jane Doe, um, Mary Sue, um, we may have five or six trustees and we go from there. It's usually um, no more than four or five, I think it is. Okay. Okay. Now again, there are the legal capacity restrictions on who may be a member and officer of a trade union. No person under the age of 16 can be a member and no person under the age of 18 can be trustee officer or committee member of a trade union. That's the legal restrictions. Where the properties of the union are vested. Again. Where is the property of the union vested? In the trustees. The trustees. Right? In the trustees. Yes. They can own property or they can lease property in the name of, in their own name mm -hmm. on behalf of the union, right? Yes. Okay. And they only have, the union only has a quasi legal personality when they are registered. Yes. Yes. Okay. We getting somewhere. You're getting this or? Or it's not it's, coming. It's coming. It's it, yeah, it's coming slowly. Okay. 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 Let's continue. Under Section 30 of the Industrial Relations Act, every registered trade union is required to file an annual return before the 1st of June of every year 
showing its full assets and liability, uh, liabilities as at the last day of the preceding year. This requirement is supplemental to the requirement under law for trade unions to keep proper account of all monies and assets and a complete list of its members. Since the okay, that's, important, one, that's important for, the, for um, them to keep this regulated for the purposes of um, you have registered them and you should now police them a bit. So they should file this on your return and it should be public so that um, the membership is well aware that their money is safe, their are, what the assets and what are the liabilities of the trade union. So you can't just tell me you have $100,000 or you have properties in your name. I need to see, is it mortgaged out? Are you in arrears, all of that stuff? And this will be represented in your annual return. And you would also have to give a proper account of all monies and assets and a complete list of the members of the union. And that's required under section 30 of the Industrial Relations Act. Okay, go ahead. Since the assets, securities, and monies of the trade union are its property, it is an offense under section 33 for any person to fraudulently obtain possession, possession of such property or to willfully withhold such assets or misapply such assets for any purpose other than those objects expressed in the constitution of the trade union. So you can't just use the trade union's money or property for your own purposes. It is now, it is an offense under section 33 of the Industrial Relations Act to do so. And we've had instances where persons would have complained that the money was not being used for the purposes that it was set out to do, eh? Yeah. So um, you will have that um, section 33 would cover them. Okay, let's go on to immunity. Somebody else will help out, Ms. Butler. Sure. Thank you. Immunity of registered trade unions. Generally at common law, a combination of two or more persons, i.e. trade union, may amount to criminal conspiracy if the object is for an unlawful act or to perform a lawful act by unlawful means. However, under section 37 of the Industrial Relations Act, Registered trade unions are granted immunity from prosecu prosecutions of conspiracy acts. Example, staging a sick out or absence from work in protest of low wages or using unlawful threats to encourage pay increases, provided that such acts are done in furtherance of a trade dispute. Okay, so their acts, may, whilst they may be amount to con criminal conspiracy outside of them being in the trade union, Section 37 of the Act now covers them where they are registered as a trade union. They're granted immunity from prosecutions of conspiracy acts. So, you know, as much as we see they stage in sick outs or they absent from work because of low wage, they protesting their low wages or they using unlawful threats to encourage pay increases, they are now granted immunity under Section 37 provided that they, they have done these acts in furtherance of a trade dispute. So before they can do these acts, they have to have filed a trade dispute and we'll get into that, unless they are now again acting unlawfully if they have not done so. So you can do these acts, but you have to also file a trade dispute first before you can proceed. Go ahead. Okay. The term further, furtherance of a trade dispute was interpreted as such in the House of Laws case of NWL Limited v. Woods, 1970, 3-all-ER-614, where it stated that a trade dispute did not cease to be a dispute connected with the terms and conditions of employment, merely because the demands made by the union on the employer regarding terms and conditions of employment were unreasonable or commercially impracticable. Nor did it matter that the demand was made and the dispute pursued with more than one object in mind. That of those objects, the predominant one was not the imp improvement of terms and conditions employment of those workers to whom the demand related. 
Additionally, registered trade unions are given immunity for acts done in restraint of trade. However, a strike taken, which is, which is in restraint of trade for an unlawful purpose will act, sorry, will attract criminal liability and prosecution. It should be noted that employers associations are also given the same immunity under section 37 in the case of an industrial lockout under the conditions prescribed by the Industrial Relations Act. With regard to liability for, for purpose of procuring a breach of contract or causing physical injury, harm or damage to person or property, Section 37 gives registered trade unions immunity from liability for such actions, which would ordinarily attract civil law damages at common law. All trade unions registered in the Bahamas must obtain prior consent or license from the, the Minister of Labor before becoming or participating as members of foreign labor or other organizations. So the trade unions um, now can go ahead in furtherance of a trade dispute and conspire more or less, eh? Where there are two or more persons is called criminal conspiracy. So they can now conspire to be absent from work deliberately in protest of low wages or using unlawful threats, right? However, they're given immunity where they're where they doing acts, that, where, they, where, where those acts are done in restraint of trade. However, it cannot be for an unlawful purpose. So you must, what, what we have to do first is do what? What we say we have to do? Before we can come together to conspire to not come to work? Hmm. What we have to do first in order for it not to be con criminal conspiracy. Um, launch a trade dispute. Yes, we have to have a trade dispute. So we have to have a trade dispute. And is the employer without remedy? Mm. What they say? It's saying the employers association is given the same immunity. Right, so they have the same immunity under section 37 mm -hmm. in the yeah. case of an industrial lockout under the conditions prescribed, I guess, by the Industrial Relations Act as well. So where they have caused injury, harm, or damage to a person, where they breach, what does section 37 give them? Immunity from liability for such action. Which which could attract civil law damages at common law. You think that's right? I think it's right. <laughs> it's left. It's still not black and white, eh? There's still some gray areas in there that, um, well, that's not hard and fast, more or less. That's what I'm saying. Right. So as much as um, you may now cause physical injury, harm or damage to person or property, and section 37 gives you some immunity as far as that, um, well, it would attract civil law damages. If it's something that's unlawful, would we say? If it's something that's unlawful? Yeah, but, but which is out of the ordinary. Because if you just, um, if you just strike in, it shouldn't get to any extremes, eh? So it says it'll attract criminal li liability and prosecution? Yeah, in cases where you've gone far above and beyond where what is reasonable within the context of a strike, eh? So physical harm or injury may occur um, as a result of shoving or some other like, but you could imagine me going out there and let's say we uh, cause so much damage that it could attract... Um, Grievous harm, could that be reasonable? Would you consider that reasonable for immunity? No. No, no, I don't think so. no, no. Yeah, that's, that's deliberate, eh? Right. Yeah, I don't think you would be covered in that instance. You've gone far beyond where it was anticipated that you would go. So as much as we know, 
we, we, we're working within reasonableness. And so we know that they are covered by what section for immunity? 37. 37. Section 37 covers them, provided they have done what? Lost a trade dispute. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Just testing you out. Let's continue. So I want you to see that we are building. I, I, I'm hoping that you are following the building, what we're doing. So we've started off with the act that covers trade unions. We've defined what it is. Yes? Yes. Yes. We have acts yes. that cover, then we say how they are registered. And who's the registrar? And we find out they need a constitution. We find out the membership, the minimum amount. Then we have, what else? How they can hold property. What is their yes. position? All of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Then we have their immunity. Yes? Yeah. Yes. And we have their requirements as to what they, how they should now file their accounts and annual returns for the purposes of what? Information to whom? Yes. To whom? Who are we giving this? Who's, who's the information for the benefit of? The employees. The, ben, the members, eh? If yeah. we the employees about, for the members. The employees yeah, the members. members yeah. Right. So first of all, it's for the members and then it's for the employees because the employees will know whether you are actually what? Registered. And, yes, and in who part are the, the union. Right. And who are the members of this union? Because you may be approaching me, you don't even have, you're not even supposed to be here. So I'll yeah, know. You have to be registered. Right. So the, this on your return and the list would provide um, employers and the membership with information on the union. Yes. Okay. Now we're going to recognize, we're going to recognize the union. Let's go ahead. Uh, legal recognition of trade unions in the Bahamas is made under section 40, sorry, section 41 of the Industrial, Industrial Relations Act, as amended by part three of the Industrial Relations Amendment Act, 1996. Section 41 sets out certain qualifications for a trade union of employees as bargaining agent for the employees. And once those qualifications are met, an employer is legally obliged to recognize and enter into negotiations with that trade union for the collective bargaining. Failure to recognize or negotiate with a trade union under the provisions of section 41 may result in the matter being reported to the Minister of Labor for review and determination of the matter. To be okay. recognized. So now, okay, so now let's pay attention to this section and we have steps what the trade union has to take to be recognized. So if you had a question on the recognition, you would want to follow these steps. So to be recognized, one. A trade union normally writes to an employer requesting to be recognized and stating the specific bargaining unit that it wishes to represent. In the written communication to the employer seeking recognition, the trade union must stipulate that it has 50% of the employees in the bargaining unit that it seeks to represent in its membership and in good standing. Okay, so we've gone through four spots. One, the trade union writes to the employer requesting to be recognized, and two, it states the specific bargaining unit that it wishes to represent. Three, um, in the communication seeking recognition, the trade union has to stipulate well that it has 50% of the employees in the bargaining unit that it seeks to represent, and that its membership is in good standing. So we had four, now we're now going to number five. A copy of the written request is also forwarded to the Minister of Labor for, for notation. So all of this communication now must also be forwarded to the Minister of Labor for notation at the same time. Number six. The employer is given 14 days or longer if by mutual agreement with the trade union of the date of receipt of the letter requesting recognition to give notice in writing to the trade union of its decision to grant or deny its request for recognition. So the, in number six, the employer has 14 days or longer if it is mutually agreed between the union and the employer 
from the date of receipt of the letter, not when you send it out, when they received it, requesting, and they have to make, they have to now give notice in writing to the trade union whether they are going to grant or deny the request for recognition. Number seven. A copy of the employer's rejection is required to be sent to the Minister of Labor by the employer, specifying his its re, or its reason for the rejection. So if the employer is going to reject the request to be recognized, for the union to be recognized, he must now, what he must do? Specify his reason. And who is he sending right. it to? Minister, of, Minister Labor. of Labor. Okay, so his he sends it to the union and then he sends a copy to the Minister of Labor. And he must specify his reasons for rejection, eh? Mm -hmm. Number eight. Similarly, the employer must send a copy of its agreement to recognize the trade union to the Minister of Labor. But it does not have to give its reasons as in the case of a rejection. Okay, so now... If he decides to recognize, he just has to send a copy of the agreement to recognize. But in this instance, he doesn't have to give a reason why he recognized. Okay? Okay. Yeah, just say that, he, that they agree. Right. He just sends on the agreement. So we have the eight steps in recognition. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's move on. Under the conditions prescribed in section 42... Five, six, and seven of the Industrial Relations Act, a trade union whose claim for recognition is rejected or deemed to be rejected by an employer has no later than 14 days after the rejection or receipt of notice of rejection to submit the matter to the Minister of Labor for determination. So upon you finding out that you have been rejected, you're going to get you're going to get a letter and they're going to send that also on to the Minister of Labor. So they know the time frame. So you have no later than 14 days after the rejection or the receipt of the notice of rejection to submit the matter to Labor, Minister of Labor for determination. So you don't agree with what they, why they reject you. So now you ask the Minister of Labor to review it and to determine whether or not you should be recognized. Okay? Okay. Go ahead. If there is only one union claiming recognition by an employer, the Minister of Labor may make a final determination and is not obligated or bound to hold a secret ballot or poll to make such a determination. Where there is more than one union claiming recognition, the Minister of Labor, under the provisions prescribed in Section 42B of the Industrial Relations Act, take a representational count or secret ballot for the purpose of determining which union qualifies for recognition under the law. All decisions by the Minister of Labor regarding applications and disputes relating to recognition are final and shall not be inquired into in any court. The Minister's decision in a recognition, dis recognition dispute is tantamount to the decision in a court of law. Rewar Damage Act, 1942. Redenton Road, Twickingham, Middle, Middlesex, 1953, Chapter 51. Okay, so in the case of when we've sent it on to the Minister for Determination or for Recognition, whether he decides to um, uh, recognize or not recognize, his decision is final. You have no appeal from that. His decision is final to a decision in the court of law. So you can't go anywhere else um, other than um, where you would have landed and that's in the Minister of Labor. So if he decides that you're not gonna be recognized, that's where the matter ends. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. As, time, as time is of the essence in the recognition of trade unions, a matter relating to the recognition of trade unions must be handled expeditiously and within a reasonable time. Bravo Bank. Do you want me to read the cases? No, you don't have to. Okay. Section 44 of the Industrial Relations Act also specifically sets out the time frame within which a claim for recognition of a trade union may be made. Under Section 44.1, a claim for recognition as a bargaining agent for employees may be made 
at any time where there is no industrial agreement in force affecting employees employed, employed by an employer and no union is recognized under the provisions of the act as a bargaining agent. However, under section 44.2, where a union is recognized as a bargaining agent under the provisions of the act, but there is no industrial agreement in force between the union and the employer, a claim for recognition must not be made by another until after 12 months from the date when the first mentioned union was recognized. So under section 44.1, so section 44 sets out the time frame within which claim for recognition of any trade union may be made. And um, how, how we, we uh, recognize as a trade union, we have steps one through, one through eight, right? Yes. One through eight, yep. Right. So you can now um, apply for um, recognition as a bargaining agent for employees where there's no industrial agreement in force affecting the employees employed by an employer and no union is recognized. Under section 44.2, however, where there's a union recognized, but there's no industrial agreement in force between the union and employer, you cannot make um, a claim for recognition until after 12 months from the date when the, when the union was first recognized. So you see the different the time frame coming in. So if they're now represented by a union, but there's no industrial agreement in place, you have 12 months. You have to wait 12 months before you approach the employer or the um before you approach the minister to say you want to be recognized or the employer. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now go ahead to 44.3. Okay. Section 44.3 stipulates that where an industrial agreement between an employer and a union is in force and registered under the act, a claim for recognition as a bargaining agent by another union may not be made by another union until after the expiration of, of two years from the date of commencement of the agreement. Okay, so now in the case of where there's claim for recognition by another union, and there's an industrial agreement in place, would they have to wait for expiration two of years. two years from the date of commencement of that agreement? Go ahead. Section 44.4 states that notwithstanding the provision of section 44.3, where an industrial agreement between an employer and a union is registered, while a claim by another union for recognition by that employer as a bargaining agent is pending, that other union, if it, if it, sorry, if it succeeds in its claim for recognition shall not be bound by that agreement. So if it's not in place as yet, it's, it's, um, and they are pending. So now the bargaining agent, they can now, they don't have to wait. There's no waiting period. They can go ahead and try to get ahead first in more or less. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. However, where in pursuance of section 42, five and six, the Minister of Labor determines that a union is not entitled to be recognized as the bargaining agent of the employees concerned or where a union having made a claim for recognition withdraws its claim, such union may not make another claim for such recognition until after the expiration of 12 months after being informed of the minister's determination or after the withdrawal of its claim, as the case may be. So they can't approach the minister or um, make a claim with the um, employers until after 12 months of the first withdrawal or rejection, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. While an employer may make an application for an injunction to prevent a tribunal from hearing and determining union complaints regarding trade recognition disputes, Courts of law are encouraged to exercise consideration of the practical realities of every case. Additionally, it should be noted that it should be noted that is an offense under section 45 of the Industrial Relations Act for an employer to dismiss, adversely affect an employee's employment, detrimentally or prejudicially adjust his position or threaten an employee with any of the aforementioned actions because of his trade union participation or involvement as a member 
officer or delegate, or if the employee appears as a witness in proceedings under the act, or on account of such employee's absence from work after an application for leave has been made for the purpose of carrying out necessary and or urgent union duties. The procedure for the revocation of recognition of a trade union by an employer or upon determination of the Minister of Labor is outlined in section 43 of the Industrial Relations Act. So it's an offense for you now to dismiss an employer, an employee, or affect his employment detrimentally or prejudicially adjust his position. So he went from supervisor to um, clerk because he is now carrying out or participating in, in the trade union. So it is an offense. It is not only an offense here, where else is it an offense? Yeah. Would it be in the Employment Act? Yes, and where else? Because you're going against what? Would we say it's the highest law? Constitution? Constitution. Yeah, because you now, because I have now joined a union, you are now um, acting contrary yeah, to my constitutional law. rights. Right. You are infringing on my rights as a, a citizen of the Bahamas. Citizen of the Bahamas? Yes. Okay. So you have plenty um, acts to help you out, right? Okay. In the case of an employee. So the employer must know what they can and cannot do and how they should handle things when they're trying to deal with certain situations so they're not acting unlawfully, eh? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. okay next, so I don't know who could, you can continue for a little bit more. If you wish. I appreciate it. Any questions on um, us recognizing trade unions and what are the procedures for revocation and all that good stuff? The offenses and the like? Any questions? No, that no, part I thought was more, more, more straightforward for me. Okay, good. So it's a lot of reading for this chapter and you would want to read it to understand it because it's the point in this in this chapter, it's more on the steps and the procedures that you have to get grasp. Okay? Okay. Go ahead. Industrial Collective Bargaining Agreements. Under Section 50 of the Industrial Relations Act, an industrial agreement is defined as an agreement between a trade union of employees and an employer. Section 51 requires that an industrial agreement be registered in order to be binding on all the parties to the agreement and on every employee within the bargaining unit covered by the agreement. The law requires that every industrial agreement has, amongst other things, a procedure for conciliation and for the prevention and settlement of general disputes which may arise between the parties. Section 46.2 of the Industrial Relations Act makes the imposition of a mechanism for the settlement of disputes a prerequisite for the registration of the industrial agreement. So in order for you to have the industrial agreement registered and recognized, you must have settlement of disputes provisions in your agreement. You must have procedure for conciliation and for prevention and settlement of general disputes. And what is the industrial agreement defined as? An agreement between a trade union of employees and an employer. And where we'll find that definition? Section 51 of the Industrial Relations Act. Section, Section 50. 50. Oh, the, where we find the definition? Yeah, the definition is Section 50, where we'll find where you, the requirement for it to be registered. That's Section 51. Excellent. Okay, go ahead. Section 55B of the Industrial Relations Act gives the registrar the power to register industrial agreements relating to both essential and non-essential services and to hear matters relating to the registration of such agreements. Before an industrial agreement is signed by the parties, a draft copy of the agreement must be sent to the registrar for approval under section 48 of the Industrial Relations Act. Okay, now we go into the steps for an industrial agreement, how it is now um, um, registered. 
So one. A copy. A draft copy of right. the must be sent to the registrar for approval under section 48 of the Industrial Relations Act. Two. A copy is also required to be sent to the Minister of Labor who may make comments on the agreement, which are then forwarded to the Industrial Tribunal for review. So that's step three. It'll be now forwarded to the Industrial Tribunals for review. Okay. Upon approval of the draft agreement, the Industrial Tribunal notifies the parties who subsequently sign a final industrial agreement as approved by the tribunal and forwards the same to it for re registration. Okay. Once registered under Section 51.1 of the Act, an industrial agreement is binding on to A, parties to the agreement and every employee within the bargaining unit, B, any person succeeding, whether by virtue of a sale or other disposition or by operation of the law to the ownership and control of the business, and C, any trade union recognized which succeeds the trade union that signs the agreement. Not okay, before we move on. Okay. We know what, what tribunal we're referring to in this instance. <clears throat> the industrial tribunal. So who opposed the um, agreement, the industrial agreement? <clears throat> who opposed the industrial mm -hmm. tribunal? Isn't it a tribunal? Minister of Labor. Minister of Labor, right? Who we started off with? The registrar. The registrar. Right, the registrar has to approve it, right? So it goes to the Minister of Labor, who makes comments, and then they forward it to the Industrial the Tribunal for review. Mm -hmm. right. Upon approval of the draft agreement, where the draft agreement went? The, the Industrial Tribunal. To, for review. So okay. it's sent to the Minister of Labor first and then to the Industrial, the industrial Tribunal. For review. Right. And right. Where, so who now approves it? The Tribunal. Okay. No, no, no. Who approves it? Oh, as approved by the Tribunal. Um, I don't know. Who approves it? We say the Registrar has to approve it, eh? Yeah, we said it first. Right. And like, so, I thought you meant after. Right. So then we now move it on to the... the we go from... The registrar to the minister and then to the to the industrial tribunal for review. Once all those persons have now looked at it, the industrial tribunal now does what? Register it. For the same to who for registration? This is to it for registration. And for the same to it for registration. Who registers it? Who we say registers the industrial agreement? Registrar. The registrar. It no, that's a proof of law. Right. Who, who registered it? Uh-huh. Who registered it? Who registered? I look confused now. No, that's why I want y'all to follow. Who registers it? Registrar. The, the registrar. registrar. Right. The registrar. And who's the registrar? <laughs> The director of labor. Okay, so we start off where it goes to him or her. It is forwarded to the minister for comments. It goes on to the industrial tribunal for review. And upon the industrial tribunal now approving it. What? What happens when the review happens? What happens? Notifies the parties who sign. And who are the parties? Who are the parties to the industrial agreement? Who are the The trade union. And? It's the an agreement in the trade union of employees and an employer. Right, so it's, either, it's the trade union, the industrial agreement between the employer and the trade union, eh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so the industrial agreement is between them. So the tribunal will say, okay, you can come now and sign the industrial agreement as approved by us, and now it will be forwarded to be registered. 
Okay, and once it's registered, all well, files, what happened? It's binding. It's binding on, on the parties to the agreement and every employee within the bargaining unit. Okay, what else? As well as any person who succeeds it by virtue of a sale or disposition or by operation of the law to ownership and control of the business. So who that refers to? Anyone who comes after? Who, 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 who's anyone? Who are we talking about in this instance? Employees. Employer. Employees. Employees. And the bargaining team. Oh, oh, ownership or, or control of the business, the employer. Ah. Right. And any person who would now join the union would also be bound by this. Uh huh. Uh huh. And who else? Any trade union? Trade union recognized. So if Which another is... trade, what could happen when this? How we could get a new trade union in here? What will happen? Because this industrial agreement signed, they recognized. How long will it take before a new trade union steps in? 12 months. No. Would we say once the agreement sign is what? It's two, two years. years. Two years. Two years. Two years. So in two years, we another trade union might step in and they now have to recognize the agreement, eh? Because this agreement may be for five years. All right. But we may have another union stepping in, so they still have to adhere to the terms of this agreement. Okay? Okay. Okay, let's move on. Any questions yes. before we move? Yeah. No. No? We getting there or it's too much? Now I have to go through that with a mm -hmm. fine tooth comb. Okay. <laughs> After. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead then. Okay. Notwithstanding the foregoing information, section 53 of the act stipulates that the following agreements, though lawful, are unenforceable by a court of law. Any agreement between members of a trade union restricting any member from entering into an individual ag agreement with an employer with regard to his employment, B, an agreement for payment of penalty to a trade union by a person, C, an agreement made between two trade unions, or D, agreements to apply the union's funds to provide benefits to members or to discharge any fine or penalty imposed on any member by the court or to furnish contributions to any employer or employee not a member of that union in consideration of the employee, or, sorry, of the employer or employee acting in conformity with the constitution or resolutions of the union. It should be noted that an agreement entered into between a trade union of employers and a trade union of employees is not within the definition of an industrial agreement for the purposes of the act. So as much as they may have these things in an agreement, if they have an agreement between the members, which any member, all of that stuff, it's not enforced, it's, it cannot be enforced by a court of law. So you can't go to court to say, I'm going to take you to court because you've agreed to, um, to pay penalty to a trade union or you've agreed you've made an agreement between two trade unions to do certain things you can't go to court and now enforce whatever agreement there's no breach in that um that the court will now be able to enforce so these agreements are unenforceable by the courts okay Okay, that's understood? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, now we go into dispute settlement procedure. So this is set out in 68 to 73 of the Industrial Relations Act. And it's for your information purposes, we will know how we go through the procedure. This is you, this, this information is particularly helpful if you had to go to the industrial tribunal at any point for uh, um, an instance where an employee may take you more or less to the industrial tribunal for any matter. 
that affects the employment. So this is the procedure that you will have to go through, okay? Save and accept where they may have the Minister of Labor, you, um, you, you will we'll set out the steps, but we'll go through it from the beginning, okay? Go ahead. You want me to continue? Okay, somebody else can help out now. I think Ms. Johnson helped us out good. Anybody who's here? I can go. Thank you. No problem. Dispute settlement procedure. Procedure for dispute resolution, section 68 to 73 of the Industrial Relations Act. First step one, report the dispute to the Minister of Labor in writing. Two, the Minister of Labor refers the parties to, to the dispute resolution mechanism in the industrial agreement, if one exists. Three, if no settlement is reached after seven days, any one of the parties may report the status of the matter to the Minister of Labor. Four, the Minister of Labor may then refer the matter back to the parties for resolution. If he is of the opinion that all avenues or opportunities under the dispute resolution mechanism have not been exhausted. Five, the Minister of Labor may initiate or commence a conciliation if no settlement has been reached after a further seven days after the second referral or attempt. Six, if after a further 16 days uh, or the expiration of a period agreed by the parties, he is unable to achieve a settlement between the parties, the Minister of Labor shall refer the dispute to the Industrial Tribunal for determination. Seven, where there is a settlement of the dispute due to, due to the steps taken by the Minister of Labor, a copy of the settlement signed by or on behalf of the parties is sent to the Minister when who then files a copy with the Industrial Tribunal. Eight, the settlement will be binding on the parties on the date of the settlement or an agreed date by the parties. Nine, the tribunal may outline and regulate its own practice and procedure for hearing disputes subject to the provisions of the Industrial, Tri Industrial Relations Tribunal Procedure Rule 1997. 10, Section 59 of the Industrial Relations Act allows the tribunal to hear or determine any dispute before it in the absence of any party who has been summoned to appear before it and has failed to do so. 11, the tribunal is mandated as, further, as far as possible to hear, inquire into, and investigate every dispute which is before it in an expeditious manner, and it may hear, receive, and and consider oral or written submissions, arguments, or evidence. A, by or on behalf of the employer or employee concerned. B, by the trade union concerned on behalf of the employees involved in the dispute. Or C, by any person having wide experience in trade unionism. 12, upon hearing a dispute, the tribunal may remit a dispute to the parties for further consideration or discussion by them in an effort to reduce and or resolve the issues related to the particular matter. In other words, it may remit the matter back to conciliation meetings with the Labor Board or independently as parties to the matter. It may also make a provisional interim or final order or award in relation to the trade dispute. Give directions, see, give directions regarding the hearing or determination of a trade dispute. D, award compensation compensation to agree to proceedings before the industrial tribunal upon filing a complaint or application for any breach or non-compliance with an order or award with the exception of an order or award for the payment of damages or compensation. E, e dismiss a matter or part of a trade dispute or other matter brought before it or refrain from further hearing or determining the matter of trivility, frivolity, or if uh, further proceedings are deemed unnecessary or undesirable in the public interest under Section 8 of the Industrial Relations Act. F, order, order any person who, in opinion of the tribunal, may be affected by an, an order or award or who the tribunal considers is just to be joined as a party to the proceedings on terms and conditions specified by the tribunal. G, hear and adju adjudicate any question which may arise in relation to a trade dispute 
in the absence of any party who has been summoned to hear, appear before the tribunal and has failed to do so. H, give directions and do all such things that are necessary or expedient to justly and fairly adjudicate matters before it in a timely matter, manner. I, award interest at a rate that it thinks spent on the whole or part of any order or award of a sum as compensation and damages. J, conduct its proceedings in a manner that it seems appropriate and just in accordance with the provisions of the Industrial Relations Act. Okay, so we started Which off I with, before we move on, we report, we, we did the dispute resolution process. And if we are unable to now to come to a resolution, we now moving the matter on to the tribunal and the tribunal now can hear the matter in the absence of any party who has been summoned to appear and has failed to do so. So if you, if the employer or the employee fails to come in, they can hear the matter in their absence. And the tribunal can now, upon hearing the dispute, they may um, remit the parties, um, remit the dispute to the parties for further consideration. So they may send you back out and say, you all try to resolve this. I think there's something y'all could go out and come back in. This usually happens um, at the minister, at the labor board, when there's um, an initial, outside of the union that is, people usually go there and they try to get you to resolve your matters before it's moved on to um, the industrial tribunal or to a court. And they would now remit the matter back to conciliation meeting with the labor board or independently as the parties may um, um, prefer. They can make a provisional or interim or final order or award, or they can give directions on hearing and determining the trade dispute. They can award compensation, but they will not be allowed to award damages or compensation for damages. They could dismiss the matter where they find that it's trivial or they just being frivolous. They set, they just bring in stuff which just don't make sense. This shouldn't even be here. At this time, we can dismiss it. Um, and to deem that any or deem that the to further the proceedings would be unnecessarily unnecessary or undesirable in public interest, because you just come here with foolishness. It doesn't make sense that we even waste the public's purse on hearing this matter any further. Um, and they can join parties. So if you said, um, I'm, I've am i bought um, company A here. They may say, we need to bring this company in as well, or we need to bring this person in. They can join persons to the matter um, where um, you've not um, done it initially. They can do that on that ter in terms of um, joining parties to the proceedings. And they would now set out the terms and conditions where they can now be joined. They will give good directions and they can award interest at the rate it thinks fit on whole or part of the um, sum as compensation and damages, but they don't award damages as a whole. And then it conducts the proceedings in the matter as they deem appropriate in accordance with the provisions of the act. So we went from the dispute resolution and if it's not resolved, we moved on to the tribunal. Okay, now we go in, into what is the, once it's determined by the tribunal, what, what is, what are the costs you have, if any, let's go on. Okay, the tribunal normally records this decision rather orally or in writing in a document signed by the chairman of the tribunal under rule 11 of the tribunal rules. It is important to know that under section 62 and 63 of the industrial relations act, any award or any order or award of the tribunal may be made retroactive from the date that the tribunal may determine as fair or just in the circumstances. And such order or award may be enforced by leave of the Supreme Court in the same manner as a judgment or order of, to the same effect. Additionally, the Minister of Labor may apply to the, the, to the tribunal for clarification or interpretation of any order or award on any particular issue under section 63. So if you went the to the tribunal today, you'd file your matter today, 
Um, but the matter has not been resolved till about four years down the line. Whenever it's settled, they can make it retroactive to the date when you first file, if they determine to do so, or they can um, go halfway. It's up to them to decide how they got, how far they'll go back. Additionally, um, the Minister of Labor can apply to the tribunal for clarification or interpretation of any order or award of any particular issue under the section 63. Whether you have made an order or an award, they may ask for clarification and the tribunal will now provide that to um, the Minister of Labor. Okay, go ahead. The decision of the tribunal is final and shall not be questioned in any court of law. However, a party may appeal and has a right to a right of appeal of a decision on point on a point of law to the court of appeal on any of the following grounds. Okay, so it's important for you to pay attention so you don't get confused. So the decision of the tribunal is final and it will not, it shall not be questioned in any court of law. But a party can appeal and has a right of appeal of the decision on a point of law only and not on the decision itself, but it, it can be on a point of law within the um, case itself, not on the decision, okay? You understand that? Yes. Okay, yes, that. okay go ahead. So on the following grounds, A, that a tribunal had no jurisdiction in the matter, but it shall not be competent by the Court of Appeal to entertain such a ground of appeal unless objection to the jurisdiction of the tribunal has been formally taken at some time during the progress of the matter before the making of the order or award. So the point of law in this instance was the, the tribunal had no jurisdiction in the matter in the first instance. The court of appeal will only entertain a ground of appeal on this point of law if you have made that point made well known. So you would say, from you get into, um, from they brought you to the industrial tribunal, you would have made um, your um, point that this, this uh, my point is this court has no jurisdiction over this matter. And I am proceeding based on you noting my objection to this court here in this matter. So you would have had to do that before the court would have proceeded in making the award, the order or award. You just can't come to the court of appeal and have never um, made that known to the court below before you came to the court of appeal. So that's your first point of law. You may be taking it out on your appeal on next. That the tribunal has exceeded its jurisdiction on the model. So they went above and beyond where the scope of their jurisdiction would have covered to hear the matter and to act accordingly. Go ahead. That the order or award has been obtained by fraud. So we know what that is. Go ahead. That any finding or decision of the tribunal in any matter is erroneous in point of law. So they made an error in, on the point of law in determining the award or even um, determining the decision in, or making the decision in this case. Go ahead. That the order or award of damages is in order, inordinately high or inordinately low. And this is usually a point of appeal that is frequently used. Um, you've, you've, in the case of an employer, it's inordinately high or in a case of an employee, it's inordinately low. Okay, go ahead. And some other specific illegality not mentioned in paragraph A, I guess that's A to whatever. Or A to e. That's supposed A. to be A to E. Okay, A to E. Um, and substantially uh, affecting the merits of the matter has been committed in the course of the proceedings. So whatever specific illegality you would now um, have your ground of appeal based on that point of law that would have been, um, would have, been committed during the course of the proceedings. Bearing in mind, you would also make it known to the court below that you found that certain things are happening that should not be happening. If you are aware at the time, you may not know until after the fact. Okay, go ahead. So now once you've 
you've been recognized by the Court of Appeal on the point of law, they now may make some, they may make some of the following orders upon hearing the appeal, the appeal. Go ahead. A, the Court of Appeal may um, say to confirm, modify or reverse the order or award appealed against. B, if the Court of Appeal confirms the order or award appealed against, to order that there shall be included in the sum which the subject of the appeal interest at the rate of 10% on this whole or any part of the sum from the date of the order or award appealed against. If it appears to the Court of Appeal that a new hearing should be held to set aside the order or award appealed against an order that a new hearing be held or to order a new hearing on any question without interfering with the finding or decision upon any other question. Generally, Section 464.2 of the Act gives the Court of Appeal the power to make such final or other order other than an order as to course, as the circumstances may require. The Court of Appeal also has the power to dismiss an appeal if it considers that no substantial miscarriage of justice has actually occurred, although it is of the opinion that any point raised in the appeal might have been in favor of the appellate. So notwithstanding, the court may now may say that um, the point raised in your appeal might have been in favor of you, in, in their opinion. If there's no substantial miscarriage of justice, they will not, um, they will dismiss the appeal and they won't carry on with the case. And they can make a final or other order but they won't make an order as to cost in the circumstances. So the Court of Appeal may hear the matter and where, what, where we'll enforce an order that's made at the Supreme Court would leave, right? Because the Industrial Tribunal will not enforce, um, it's not where you enforce your orders. If the Industrial Tribunal would have given you, if they said, okay, I, I'm a Putting you ten thousand dollars, and the employer was supposed to pay it, and they've not paid it. With the leave of the court, you would now go to the Supreme Court and force the order. Okay. Yes. Yes. yes okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Who's gonna take us home? Any questions so far? No questions per se, but I just, this is a, definitely a chapter that I'm going to have to reread and- So it's more procedural. Notes. It's a lot yeah. of procedures. And mm -hmm. so once you can follow um, and, and set out what you need to do, more or less, you don't have to know this verbatim, but it's mm -hmm. just so you would understand where you go um, for relief. So you go through the Minister of Labor first at the Department of Labor. And if you get no recourse there, you may take it to the industrial tribunal, which is more or less is an informal court compared to going to the Supreme Court where the costs are a bit more. And you can get a, um, the same recourse down at the industrial tribunal and reduce your cost considerably. And you can represent yourself and they're pretty good. But usually that's where you would take your employment matters to the industrial tribunal, especially in the case of um, trade unions. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Who's taking us on? Okay, it's um, the last one. Yes, thank you. So is it industrial actions? Yes. Okay, industrial actions. Although industrial action may be carried out by the parties, there is a clear procedure that must be adhered by the parties as outlined in the Industrial Relations Act before they may com commence a strike, lockout, or other industrial action. Once the trade dispute has been referred to the tribunal for its determination, all parties engaged in an industrial action must cease their participation in such action otherwise they will be liable on summary conviction by the courts under section 76 and 77 of the act. So once the trade dispute has been referred to the tribunal for its determination, industrial action must cease. 
any any continuance of the industrial action will now be they'll be liable to some conviction by the courts under section 76 and 77 of the industrial relations act okay yeah. go ahead types of industrial action walk out a walk out a walk out is a a walk out is an industrial action where some of or all employees within the bargaining unit leave their place of work. A walkout may be spontaneous or planned in advance and may be carried out either before negotiation of a dispute or after the dispute has begun. Secondly, strike. A strike is a large scale work stoppage. Thirdly, work to rule. And the fourth one is sick out. Massive ab absences to purported sickness of employees who may also be members of a trade union. Under section 77 of the Industrial Relations Act, a strike or lockout is illegal and punishable by law if it is carried out during the period in which a trade dispute is pending before the tribunal or on appeal to the Court of Appeal. Generally, the Industrial Relations Act 1970 protects members of a trade union for acts done in furtherance of a trade dispute, including protection from dismissal for participation in a strike. This statutory protection allows the employee to be safeguarded against certain legal action and penalties for strike action, which would have been brought against the employee for breach of the contract of employment under common law. A strike is defined under section two of the Industrial Relations Act as the cessation of work by a body of persons employed acting in combination or a concerted refusal or a refusal under a common understanding of any number of persons employed to continue to work for any employer in consequence of a trade dispute done as a means of compelling the employer or any person or body of persons employed or aiding other employees in compelling their employer or any person or body of persons employed to accept or not to accept terms or conditions of or affecting employment. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A lockout is defined under section two of the act as the closing of a, of a place of employment or the suspension of work or the refusal by an employer to continue to employ any number of persons employed by him in consequence of a trade dispute done with a view to compelling those persons or to aiding another employer in compelling persons employed by that, that other employer to accept terms or conditions of or affecting employment. Okay, so remember we talked about um, under section, I think it was 37, where we talked about where they can now um, commence certain actions. And we said the employer has uh, a right as well. Yes. yes. And that was the industrial lockout. That was on page 117, remember that? So this is the lockout we were talking about, okay? Okay. So they can close their place of employment, suspend work, or refuse to continue to employ any number of persons employed by him in consequence as a result of a trade dispute. Um, it affected my business. I can't continue with the amount of persons I had. Mm -hmm. You see? So mm -hmm. they, have, they have remedies as well. Okay? Okay. Go ahead. Sick out may be used by trade, trade unions to legitimize a work stoppage during negotiations, particularly where such negotiations are proving difficult to direct in favor of the proposed or preferred terms and conditions of the union. Notwithstanding the fact the massive absences due to the purported illnesses may be supported by medical certificate by licensed doctors. There have been decided cases in the Caribbean, R versus Industrial Disputes Tribunal, Ex parte Alcan, Jamaica Company, suit number M35 of 1980, Jamaica, and the England Hutchison versus Enfield Rolling Mills, 1981. 
where employers were en entitled to challenge the circumstances slash facts where workers were absent from work due to illnesses, even where a medical certificate is produced, and particularly in instances where there's, there's maybe a sick out. There is or maybe a sick out. So the employer, again, has a remedy. They can challenge the circumstances of facts that these workers are actually sick um, based on the sick certificate. And they have cases to uh, assist them in this, eh? They have mm -hmm. RV industrial disputes because now they can challenge whether this is actually a legitimate um, sick slip, eh? Are you actually sick? You've produced a sick certificate. Um, and if they want to go hard and fast and go to the extreme, they can now challenge it, okay? And with the view to now doing what? But we could dismiss this. We could summarily dismiss them, eh? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. For what? Dishonesty? 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 Dishonesty, Dishonesty yeah. So we could dismiss them in this case. Okay, go ahead. With regard to work to rule, an employee may be liable for breach of a contract of employment where he construes the work rules unreasonably and acts upon that unreasonable construction or interpretation. And this is in the cases of Secretary of State for Employment versus Associated Society of Locomotive Engineers and Fireman in 1972 to all ER 949. So where the, employer, where the employee now works to rule, because now he's construing um, your rules unreasonably or interpreting them and constructing uh, the unreasonable construction and interpretation, you can now say they are, they are in breach of their contract. Yes? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're now being hard and fast and trying to just literally take what is there and not and say or literally i'm only supposed to work i'm only supposed to do this or i'm only supposed to do that when they are misinterpreting or they are unreasonably interpreting the rules or the work rules in this instance okay go ahead it should be noted that there is a code of industrial relations practice under section 40 of the industrial relations act Although the provisions of the code are not binding on the employer, employee, or union, the industrial tribunal may take into account for the purpose of determining the issue before it, any provision of the code which may appear relevant. So they can, as much as it may not be um, binding, they can use it as persuasive in order for them to now make a decision in a matter. They, this code may be a guide more or less. Okay, any questions? A lot of information, of course. Yes? Yes. Yes, a lot. A lot let's, of attempt, let's attempt some of the questions, let's attempt all of the questions at least, and we can wrap up. I know it's been a long evening, but we can knock this out in two seconds. Number one, define a trade union under the Industrial Relations Act, where we'll find that answer. Section 50. At the Industrial Tribe, the Industrial the, Relation Act. Which page will we find that answer on? 112. 112. 112. What is it? Yeah. Under the heading of? Of definition of a trade union. Excellent. Slash legality of trade union. Awesome. Number two. The blank is empowered by the Industrial Relations Act to register as a trade union within the definition prescribed by, the, by that act. Where we'll find that answer? Section 55B. Who is empowered by the Industrial Relations Act to register as a trade union where we'd find that? Oh. Who is? Where we'll find the answer for that question. 
Page 113. Uh, what is it? The registrar. Yes. Empowered. And that's under registration of trade unions in the Bahamas. Number three, there must be at least blank members for a trade union of employees and at least blank members for a trade union of employees for registration. Where we'll 15, find that answer. 15 and three. 15, 15, 15 and three. And, three. And, three. and where's that answer? What page? Page 113. Oh, okay. Number four, what is the procedure for registration of a trade union? Where we'll find that answer? Page 113. 113, and what is the procedure? Where is it covered? From additionally, until the registrar may cancel. Move on the next page. Yeah. Additionally, the trade union is required to have a constitution. Remember, we okay. started with registrar with the registrar. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So we go down from there and we stop where it fails to do so. Yes, cancellation. Okay. So registration stops at where they are mm -hmm. required to have an office. That's the procedure. Remember, we went through the steps? Yes. Okay. Number four, five, what must a trade union do to be recognized in the Bahamas? Where we'll find that answer. Page 115. And what is it? We have some steps. There were, like, there were about eight steps. And where we start off with, what paragraph? Start to be recognized. And we okay. end with? We ended with um, the paragraph that starts the employer. Yes, it's given and it ends with in the case of a rejection, eh? Right. Everybody has that? Yes. Yes. My page oh. numbers are different though, but I see it. <laughs> okay, my page number in this instance was 118. I don't know. Oh, my own too, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll mention my page to assist then. Okay, number six, what must happen before an industrial agreement is signed by the parties? We will find that answer. That's my 120 under industrial collective bargaining agreements. And that's paragraph four, before an industrial agreement is signed by the parties. Remember that? Yeah. That's my 117. And then what we had, we had some steps in there, right? Yes. One, two. Yeah. Remember four. the steps? I, now one, that's two, why one, I was two, giving four. you all the steps, eh? Mm -hmm. It was four steps. Yes. You remember? Yes. That's why I was pointing out those steps to y'all so y'all would make a note, okay? Mm -hmm. Y'all have it? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay, now explain the dispute settlement process under the Industrial Relations Act. Where we'll find that? Page 118 for us. Yeah. That's 121 for me under procedure for dispute resolution. Yeah. One true. Well, not one through nine. nine. Well, one, no, one through nine. Oh, okay. Because what happens at our ten? Allows the tribunal to hear or determine the dispute. What what happens there? Is it settled anymore? What has happened? Where settlement stopped? The tribunal has the final say, right? So, so no. Where the settlement was supposed, where it was supposed to be settled? At number eighty. Eh? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. After that, what happened? You all didn't settle, and we had to go where? To the industrial. Right, we had to go it to the tribunal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What are the types of industrial actions? We will find that answer. One twenty-one. One twenty-one, and that's our one twenty-five under types of industrial actions. And um, give me an example of two. Strike. 
walk out. Okay. First, and work to rule. And work to rule. Okay. Number nine, define a strike and lockout for the purposes of section two of the Industrial Relations Act. Where we'll find those answers? Page 122. Page 125 for us. And that's a strike is defined under section two of the Industrial Relations Act, as well as a lockout is defined under the same section of the act. Mm -hmm. Number 10, how may an employer handle a sick out of union members even where a medical where medical certificates are produced? How may they handle it? Where we'll find that answer. It's 120 to 123. 120. Okay. Yeah. And that starts with paragraph. That's 125 for me. Sickles may be used by trade union. And notwithstanding, may be supported. We go right there and continue where they have the cases and the, the work, the employer may challenge it. Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we've covered a lot and we did it in brackets, breaking speed, eh? <laughs> Hopefully we, some portions of it would stick and you can just do another read over and try to just get the steps down because it's more or less procedural and knowing where you look to cover your grounds and dealing with disputes as well as recognizing the trade unions if they're in industrial agreements who can now be recognized? Who's your registrar where you'd be recognized? How are dispute settlement processes um, taking place? And what are the intricacies and challenges of industrial actions? And is there any remedies for the employers where industrial actions take place? So it can be that employer-employee relationships are lopsided where only the employees benefit. Eh? It's also for the employers as well, and they have recourse and remedies. And in this instance, I think you're representing employers, so it's good for you to be aware of what um, rights the employers have in dealing with employees. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Any questions? Are you a teacher by profession, Ms. Dorset? No, I am a lawyer by profession. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a teacher. <laughs> yeah. I try to break it down, um, though, because I would have liked it to be broken down when I was in school. So I try to make it as um, any course I'm doing, I try to make it for dummies so anybody can understand what they're doing. So I wanted my courses to be for dummies so I can... You just need to show me where to go. I don't, you don't need to make me try to figure it out. I'll figure it out once you guide me properly, yes? Okay. So that's more or less. You know, you, you, you used to have these books called Word for Dummies, This for Dummies. Mm -hmm. So I, I usually try to do all of my things because I was hoping in school they would give you, but they seem to make it more difficult than it needs to be. And if you are guided, I think you'd get the point quicker. So I'm hoping that I would have broken it down for you in a format that anybody could have known, not to say you're a dummy. I'm just saying that's what the book title used to be, just to say it can be broken down so low that anybody should be able to understand it, especially with so much information in here. Um, yeah. I think you need a could lot of information overload. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it's not as if you're doing this full time. So you need as much help as you can get because you have your own workload um, as the day progresses. And I know you can't dedicate as much time as you would want to in trying to get this information down. So I try to just point you into the direction you need to look at instead of trying to read it as a whole, but just narrow it down to what you need to know. Okay. So hopefully that was helpful um, in that instance. I know it's a lot, but I think once you um once you're pointed in the right direction, it'll help you. How is it going so far? So, so far, so good. 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 So this wasn't too cumbersome this evening, eh? It was, it was different. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> Definitely. 
Okay. <laughs> it was different in a good or bad way. In a good okay. way. In a good way. Okay. In a good way. okay. Yeah. It's just that your style is different. Okay. Not in a bad way. No, no. in a good way. Okay, good. All right. So we'll continue next week. We don't have much to do in module nine. I don't know, because it only sets out this legislation. So I'm going to find out if they want me to do module 10 for you as well, or if they want me to break out um, the acts in these instances to assist you. Okay? Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you for um, engaging so long, because I know it's a long evening. We took a while, but we got through it in any event. Okay? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Y'all have a good evening. You too. Good evening. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.